Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wanted ultimate success in your life, then do we have the Big Miracle Show for you. Today I'll be talking with Joanna Garzilli, spiritual success coach, motivational speaker, and author of a fantastic new book, Big Miracles. And that's just what I want to talk with her about today, about the 11 spiritual rules for ultimate success. That plus we'll talk about Nazca Lions in Peru, sparkle-covered miracle boxes, NASCAR races and spas, Happy Now t-shirts, the power of two weddings, trying out at 40 for the Laker girls, and what in the world Mr. Purple Briefs has to do with anything. Gotcha. So welcome to the show, Joanna. Are you ready to shine? I am ready to shine. I am shining. Woohoo! <laughs> yeah. So before we dive right into things, how did you end up trying out for the Laker girls? So when we lived in West Hollywood in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. we watched this show called Laker Girls. And this is when my son, Dominic, was three. Love this show. And, and Nick said to me, my husband, he said, well, you know, I think you can do that. And I said, I think I can do that too. Now, let me just tell you, my dance background is that when I was a kid, I, I did ballet a little bit, mm -hmm. but my mom, bless her, she thought that I danced like an elephant, which as a sensitive six-year-old, very empathetic, was not great for my self-esteem. And then as I progressed into my teenage years, I went and danced in clubs a lot. I was never, never got into the drugs or the alcohol or any of that, but I was really into dancing and staying up late. So I'd get up on those podiums, dance away up on the stage. So of course I thought, well, going and doing some choreographed dance isn't going to be a big deal. And at my gym, I was going to Equinox in West Hollywood across the street. <clears throat> there was a dance teacher there, Alan Avenado, who is like a celebrity makeup artist. And I used to watch through the glass, through the in, like looking through the glass sort of where you could see into the classroom, all these really cool hip West Hollywood people <clears throat> doing video dance jam. And I thought there's no way I'm going in that class. One day I made myself go in. And after the class, I said, my husband has dared me to go up for Laker Girls. And my goal is to get through the first round. And, and he said, I said, what do I need to do? What's your advice? And he said, you need to go to as many dance classes as you can at, <clears throat> let's say, three, four, ideally five classes a week. And you need to be dancing three, four hours a day. Now, bear in mind, I have a fully fledged business, coaching business. So I just thought, and well. And a three-year-old, if I understand. Yeah, and a three-year-old at that point. So I said, I know, well, I'll do what I can. And I said, well, where are the best dance studios? And he said, Millennium and and uh, the, oh my gosh, it's totally gone out of my head, Edge. Yeah, so Millennium and Edge, one in North Hollywood, the other one in Hollywood. So I just started going on doing all these classes and I was alongside Broadway dancers and people were in videos with 50 Cent and Beyonce. And it was terrifying. It was absolutely terrifying to me, but it was so good because it took me back to, getting outside of my comfort zone, which I'm sure we'll talk more about, Rule 11. And the, the most, it wasn't the day that I went up for the show for Laker Girls that was the hardest. It was the day before when I was going to do two last dance classes back to back. And I, I, I didn't know what a turns class was. For people who don't know what a turns class is, it is where you pirouette. <laughs> He <laughs> basically pirouette. It made me really, really dizzy. Well, it turns out this particular class was 11 to 14 year olds. And there was me at 40. And I wanted to die. And these, you know, being in Hollywood, right, these kids are amazing from a young age. And I came out of that class. Nick was waiting for me in the car outside. Dominic was strapped in in the back in his car seat. We were getting ready to go to the next dance class. He said, how was it? And I burst into tears and I said, it was absolutely terrible. And he said, well, do you not want to go to the next class? I said, no, 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 I've got to just keep going. So I think that was a big lesson of this feeling embarrassment and shame that has stopped me so much in the past. And I know for so many people, it stops them as soon as, you know, that thing of when we have dreams and we say, well, that voice says inside of ourselves, which isn't our voice, it's a voice from someone outside of us that says, well, who do you think you are to do that? 
I made myself go and do the next class. And then when it came to the next day to go for the audition, we went to the uh, Toyota Center in El Segundo where the Lakers basketball team practices. And I remember we pulled up outside and there was all these cameras from, it was Time Warner cable then, it's now Spectrum Time Warner. And there was this big line of girls. And Nick turned to me and he said, well, you may not be able to dance. <laughs> <laughs> but you're a bloodhound to a camera. I had this image of like, bloodhound, <laughs> yeah. I thought, yes, I can do that. So I just went and got in line and I talked to this girl who just driven all the way from Colorado and she was determined to make it, you know, through the rounds to get onto the team. And then suddenly the producers heard a British accent because I'm from London originally. And they said, oh, well, we want to interview people that have come from from far away. I guess they didn't know that I live in California now, but they they started to, they wanted to follow my storyline. And this is where the skills I think of being in different industries, because I'd come from, I used to work for MTV and doing producing. I knew like I need to give them a good thread, a storyline. And obviously I'm not a dancer. So I brought in my metaphysical experiences with meditation and angel cards mm -hmm. and next thing that happened I ended up bombed the dance routine could not remember what to do Lisa Estrada who was the director for Laker Girls when she saw what I did like she just looked away it was totally embarrassing part of me just wanted to die there was that sinking feeling in my stomach and I went you know what it's okay like the fact that I showed up there and and just to do that, and I got to be there for the other girls that were trying out. I made some good friends that day, and it was it was such a positive environment to be in. And the interesting thing of what happened after that was I made it on to season two premiere episode, a full two-minute storyline. I was the only person on there who couldn't dance that ended up being part of Laker Girls history. So my husband was ecstatic about that. But the byproduct of that was my goal wasn't to set out to become a professional dancer. But what it did was it really helped me move past shame and to go, well, if you have a dream, you know, you start off, you practice and then improves the other areas of your life where you do have dormant talents and skills and those seeds of miracles already within you. Woohoo! Yeah. <laughs> I, I've got goosebumps because, and, and I want to jump more into your storyline and I gotta, I've got to ask about this co-venture you've got first, but the yeah. confidence building that you get, because you just stepped off, that was stepping off a really big cliff, blindfolded, yeah. not having any idea what's going to happen. I took years ago, I was, I was training for, a, I was sponsored by Rollerblade and, and I took a, a, a dance class, a ballet class, and it was little five-year-old girls kicking my butt. <laughs> I can't even... Imagine that you had the bravery, the guts to do that and what that means for everything you did after that. I, I have a feeling you're a better, chore better at choreographed dance than me. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be funny if we danced together one day, right? We'd do like a little routine. It, it would be um, bravery. Yes, that's the yeah. word for it. So before we dive in, I really wanted to go back to your early childhood. But before that, I just met Nick. He just came on, your, your husband, on, on the line before we started. What in the world is Hyper Chariot? Yes. So <clears throat> Hyper Chariot, we are a transport company that is going to be, bring the fastest, most environmentally friendly travel to the planet. And so... You know, things don't things happen in stages, right? Within this next, I would say within this next 10 years, sort of like how Kennedy said, we're going to go to the moon within this next 10 years, we will be traveling in tubes at 4000 miles per hour safely. And we're going to be enjoying it too. So I understand for some people, they think, Whoa, oh my gosh, well, this is really scary. But again, you know, this is something that we are going to make happen. And, and we see throughout history that the Wright brothers <clears throat> have done this. We have clues throughout history where this has actually happened. And we have turned science fiction into science fact. So that is our focus there. We're going to start off with a 400 mile per hour ride called the Velocitator. <clears throat> we already have several locations to build that. And it's going to be really, really, I mean, it's going to be super exciting. So I never thought that I would move into that space. Nick came into the the 
you know, future modes of transport, bringing personal rapid transit networks. He's been in that space for a number of years already. And, and he has a brilliant mind. He is so, so visionary. Actually, a number of years ago, we were, I was in a, a guided meditation. I wasn't leading that guided meditation, but as I was sitting there in meditation, I had a vision of all this stuff happening. I didn't realize I would be so much a part of it. And it brought me to tears. Literally, I was in tears because I saw how we would be connected across the planet and that we will have at first tubes going across America that will eventually be tubes across the UK, tubes across Australia, tubes across the globe. And that uh, we will be able to, I mean, when I think about, say, back in the day, Imagine how long it took to drive from, you know, in a wagon going, say, from the the Midwest coming across to California or even that when the Wright brothers, right, their first flight across the U.S. was 80, I think it was 84 days. And so everything has got quicker and faster and faster. So, again, thinking of, say, Amazon, where they say next day delivery, it'll be next hour delivery. But a big component as well is bringing more and more safety because people talk about this technology and say, oh, it must be really dangerous. Well, we're going off of amusement park ride standards, safety standards. And we know from amusement parks, I think it's uh, – I, 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 Nick will tell me the statistics are probably <laughs> – I don't want to botch the statistics, but I think it's roughly for every sort of just over a million people that there's maybe four or five accidents that happen. But it's a fraction of what happens compared to rail or with trains as well, and and obviously with <clears throat> with cars. So yeah, I do not have an engineering background, but the more I'm around this stuff, I'm just learning and and understand. It's sort of like with the dance, right? You start somewhere, and it's and and for me, what drives me to do this is that. It's going to be a physical internet of connecting people together. I've always been focused on the spiritual. And so I, so I suppose Big Miracles has really helped me get aligned and go, Joanna, you can do this. You can take all your different skills and bring them to the picture here with Hyper Chariot. And then the other really exciting, cool thing is that Matthew Modine is the president of our company who is in the TV show Stranger Things. So it's so amazing to have him part of our team as well because he brings such wisdom, such insight, and he is very much about you know, activism, well-being for the planet, human rights. And, and so, yeah, so we have you know, him on our team and a number of amazing other people. So we can't wait to look for – hopefully we'll come back on with, with Nick and – and he'll be more eloquent than me that <laughs> talking about hypergerius. I'll, I'll look forward to it, and and I I geek out by this sort of things, and I try to follow it when I can, and and I don't admit to to knowing almost anything about the technology, but him speaking briefly, talking about maglev technology and traveling in a vacuum with no air resistance, and I'm just thinking yeah. a exceptionally cool, b exceptionally fast, c much cleaner solution and clean, good, needed now. Exactly. It really is needed now. And I think that's why we have such an urgency. Again, we've been working on this for several years and we're about to roll this out. A lot's going to happen within this next couple of years. And it's, it's, you know, I think back to when Nick was on BBC World News back in 2013 and the reporter said to him, so isn't this a little bit out there? But now, you know, it's really becoming okay, this is happening. This this is moving forward. So it, it's so interesting to watch people go from disbelief mm -hmm. and, and almost sort of and ridicule in some ways to, wow, this is so cool. But I think that when people are in disbelief or they have a lot of resistance, it's just that underlying that is fear. It's because when you don't know and you don't understand something, of course that's sort of pushback. Yes. And that's why persistence is so important and continuing pushing through with things there's something really interesting in there um i don't know how to unpack this resistance pushing forward and a vehicle that has no resistance mm -hmm. i i you know i can tell you through this experience with hyper chariot i've had a lot of resistance come up 
over a period of the last couple of years and moving towards doing this. And now I feel that as I embrace Nick's vision of Hyper Chariot and supporting him in that and really being on board, that that is bringing a lot of personal healing for me. It's really bringing me great fulfillment as well. And, and I love, I was sharing with him the other day, this great Ted talk, I'm trying to remember who it's by, maybe, you know, but where he talks about where you have the leader and you have the first followers, (laughs) you know, the person that is the leader and just looks absolutely ridiculous at first, everyone's sitting on the sidelines. And then you have that first follower Mm -hmm. and then you have that second follower and people sort of going, Oh, okay. Well then they have a little bit of interest. And then sitting on the sidelines is where you don't want to sit on the sidelines. You really want to get in there. So I think it is, it does, it takes courage to step up there and put yourself out there because you know that people are going to have some sort of reaction. But what I always do for myself is come back to, well, this isn't about me or whether someone likes me or dislikes me or thinks I'm incredibly smart or stupid. It is about serving a vision, a mission. And essentially what you were saying before is bringing improvement of quality of life for people and to the planet. We really need to take care of everyone on this planet and not just deplete its resources and find ways to do things more efficiently. That is really how we should be living. And so that is our focus. That is our mission there, to care for everyone and everything in a very responsible way. How could you ask for anything more than that? You say late in the book, and and then I want to dive into your history, but late in the book, you're talking about the idea of be that first person, be the pioneer, step out there, get the arrows, because you can't actually, it's the dirty F word, fail. Just taking that step into the unknown, no matter what happens, you've succeeded. Absolutely. I mean, I find now more and more going through my life, let me go back a step. And rule four, forgive mistakes. What came to me was this idea of, well, what if your mistakes are miracles waiting to happen? And there was a period in my life for a number of years where I derailed. I wasn't, it's not like I was totally out of alignment, but I would derail and get back on track. And I think that's like that for most of us, where I was terrified to fail because I felt this, when I failed at something, this utter shame and sense of rejection. Mm -hmm. But what I realize now is that failure is just part of our spiritual growth. Failure doesn't mean we just stop. Failure doesn't mean that our life is doomed. Failure just means that it's giving us information. It's showing us ideas, things to be able to shape, to form, to evolve, where we can actually move forward, that we can make improvements for ourselves, where we can inspire, right? Just like you're doing the show, Woo-hoo. we can inspire others. And so now I'm, I'm learning more and more to embrace failure and just go, what, are, what, what's working here? What isn't working here? Okay. What do I need to do next? How do I go and make improvements? And so, yeah. What's great about that too is, and you have a lot of amazing exercises in the book, and so a lot of it is is journaling and writing and coming to understand yourself. If you step back and look at the timeline of your life and look back at your quote-unquote failures, you'll either find A, they weren't failures at all, or B, they were times where you were out of alignment, something that's big in your book, and it was just actually helping get you into alignment. Absolutely. Here's the thing. When we reach for something more, we are naturally going to go into a misalignment. Because think if we're if we're here, like if someone's here mm-hmm. and then they want to move to here, when you move from here to here, point A to point B, and this is the big miracle over here, then a misalignment's going to occur because you're not used to being in that space over there. And, and so of course things are going to be different. The first time you try something, your, your mind is, it doesn't have that memory of, oh, go through the motions, do that certain thing. And so it is, it, when you get to the point and you can say, oh, I'm a misalignment's happening here. And it's not something bad per se. It's just, teaching me something and then that instead of reverting back over here one's able to go okay well I can just move to that new place and the idea of 
shame, embarrassment, feeling a retraction of wanting to recoil. Instead, one can just sort of just be open and allow oneself to go, I'm going to step into this new energy and allow myself to be in that space, just like it was for me with being with those 11 to 14 year olds. You know, I, when I look back, I was so triggered around those kids because it made me, it was, it was a trigger from when I was six years old and, and doing the ballet on stage and that reminder of, well, maybe I am like this big elephant that can't do things properly. But something that really came to my awareness for me, from my spirit, from my soul, mm -hmm. was if I had gone to dance school, if I had pursued, I, I think I would have become a really, really good dancer. I think, again, with the right training, with the right encouragement, we can become really good at many, many different things. Another time, I pushed myself outside of my comfort zone, and I ended up going and doing voice training with because I went to Howard Fine Acting School, and then David Corey, he teaches, he teaches voice work there, and they have a class called Singing for Actors. So I thought, well, I'll go and, I'll go and do this class. And he had us all standing around the piano in the theater, and he said, is there anyone here who is tone deaf? And I put my hand up. I was the only person that put my hand up. So he said, okay, and he started going along with his hands along the piano, and he said, okay, do those notes. And I went, bright red, looked around, you mean me, <laughs> go and do that. So I, I did the best possible to hit the, the notes. And he said, oh, you're not tone deaf. You just don't know how to sing. You just haven't been trained. And, and so again, this thing of if we can have a willingness to be bad at something initially, how can we be brilliant out the gate at something? It's just not possible. It's totally unrealistic. And yet, I think that we have been programmed, not, not intentionally, but by our parents wanting us to do well, for, for them wanting the best for us. It just hasn't been communicated in the right way. It comes across negatively and it's, well, why aren't you great at that already? You should be there already with stuff. My, it puts a lot of pressure on us. My mom, I was, what, 16, 17 years of age. I'm sitting on the couch. I can still see myself on the couch. When she mm. brings in a magazine or newspaper article with Bill Gates on it and says, why? And, you know, he's already a, a gazillionaire. She goes, why can't you be more like him? I'm still in high school. Going, yeah. What chance do I stand of meeting the expectations of these people? And that's what we get. And then they get stuck yeah. in our heads. And that even that, that, that thing of where there is that comparison, right? I mean, <sighs> comparison is a, is, a, is a crazy difficult thing to deal with. <clears throat> but I think if one turns it into this thing of, of inspiration, again, competition doesn't have to be a negative thing. Because I know now when I put myself in an environment where there is competition, from you know fitness to in business that it allows us it motivates us it puts us in a vibration to be able to say i'm going to stretch myself i'm going to do more we we do this class at equinox in santa monica called precision running i've never done track and field i mean coming from england like that's not a big big thing at all so my husband said to me why don't we start going and doing this running class yeah, I am not naturally a fast runner at all. But what's so cool, that I've, what I love about this concept mm -hmm. is that when everyone's on the treadmills, so you're all on your end and it's like they, they darken, it's sort of like a nightclub wow. <laughs> for running. It's so cool. It's the only lab in the world where they have this precision running lab. And, um, and so we're all on our treadmills and we have our, what's called a PR. Now I know what a PR is. What's a PR? I'm like freaking out at first your like your personal record for how fast that you can go. But the really cool thing is you can run with people in the same room who are beginners mm -hmm. to people who are professional athletes, but we're all in the class and we all have our personal record. But there is something of that team energy where you just feel this momentum and where you want to stop maybe, or you feel you can't break through, you keep going. And, and so that we're all trying to reach our own personal record. And I think it's like that for, 
whether someone wants to be a writer, whether someone wants to shift out of corporate to open their own business, whether someone wants to get out there and say, wow, I have a story and I want to start my own YouTube channel, <laughs> right? It's there, there really is that thing of that if I'm running on my own mm -hmm. versus I'm in that group energy, it really stretches me to be more. I mean, since I've started in a few weeks, I've gone from a, a PR of seven to now I'm at around 8.1. And, you know, I, I know that I will progress and keep doing a little bit more. And, and then I have to notice when I look at, like I glance over at someone's treadmill to see where their PR is, what they're running at. And this, I have to catch myself in my head of, oh, I'm going faster than them. Oh my gosh, I'm going so much slower than that person. And then go, it doesn't matter. You know, cancel, 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 get back to we're here and we have this collective energy in the room. So it's, I find it so beneficial for myself just to try different things. And again, this goes back to the getting outside of one's comfort zone that I'm learning so much about myself. Let's go from there and let's go back in time. I was going to go back in time to, 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 to the age of six, but I think I'll bring us forward a little bit. You're, war, you're working, I'm not sure if it was uh, Merrill Lynch you were working for at the time, mm -hmm. um, when you read uh, the Celestine Prophecies and you cracked in a good way. Yeah, I, I, I love business. I love corporate finance. I mean, I'm really into business. Some people say like, oh, well, you get people who are creative, some people in business. I think business is an extremely creative thing. So I'm very passionate about it. But at the time in London, being in the city of London, it was very old boy network. There wasn't, you know, there wasn't room to be able to just go and to, to be able to give input, to have opportunities. And, and I suppose the way I could have carved out an opportunity for myself to move up and have more influence in the banking world would just to plug away diligently. And I am naturally quite a driven person. I'm impatient. So I just didn't, I didn't want to, to me, it just looked like a 25 year track to get anywhere. And so it's sometimes like what I've learned for myself is sort of to just go off in a totally different direction. So I remember one day sitting at my desk, I ended up reading James Redfield, The Celestine Prophecy. And I had that sort of feeling inside me. And I'd gone to one of those the psychic fairs in London and I'd met Yuri Geller, right, who bends the spoons. And I I just went, something, I, I something's gotta change here. I can't, if I go on this track like this, I'm gonna die inside. I'm just going to be going through the motions. And so I think that goes back to the thing you were talking about failure before. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we don't know how things are going to work out. And we really, we have to trust our instincts to sort of to zigzag, to jump in a different direction. And then it's going to allow us to sort of get back on the track we wanted to get in, sort of like going through a wormhole, <laughs> just making those quantum leaps. And so you ended up down in Peru, camping out I by the did. Nazca lines. Oh, gosh. I mean, when I think back now, how crazy that was, we ended up having this guy who we didn't know. Mm -hmm. So he just dropped us off in a van and we were miles, miles and miles from, from anywhere. And there was just nothing out there. But I felt so spiritually connected that I just trusted. It was like, okay, well, we're out in the space. I didn't think about the scorpions or the things. We heard weird noises of certain animals in the night. But it was a blast. I had such a good time. It was it was really magical. And and again, just coming from being in that London club scene and growing up in northwest London and I'm so glad that I had that foundation, but this was just such a 180 to be in such a different environment with such different people. I was very much just used to, even though I moved in London in a very international crowd, it was just a certain type of person. So going on the adventure was super, super fun. Now, in the Celestine Prophecy, you know, they're dodging bullets and it was sort of crazy. We didn't have that in the desert, but when we traveled to it, the first time I remember going to Mexico and we went all the way across Mexico mm -hmm. and we had, um, 
uh, that it was Independence Day. It was Mexican Independence Day. So we didn't have bullets sort of flying at us, but we ended up, we couldn't get out of the city. And we asked for a low profile car. They put us in this bright red rental car. So there's, this is in my slightly more new agey, crazier days. We're all dressed in white. Uh, Wendy, who was my spiritual mentor, she used to be a queen. Um, she used to be dressmaker, so the queen mother. Uh, she's like waving some crystal, and we're driving in this this red like little. I can't remember what the red car was. But it was, I guess, there'd been some rainstorm. It's all damp on the seats, stunk in the car. Somehow we end up in this procession of tanks. It was crazy. So you got one tank after the other, and then there we are. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I really want to get out of here. And I had a suitcase. I didn't realize travel with a backpack. So then I'm with a suitcase. When we then eventually we got out of there, where we went to Teotihuacan. Then we went on to Palenque um, in the jungle out there because we wanted to connect into all the Mayan energy and Lord Packle and going down in the chambers. So when we were going into Palenque, again, that's where they had all the military there. They had them with guns to like, you know, unlock your suitcase. <laughs> I realized next trip. Do not travel with a suitcase, <laughs> right? Learn from the mistake there. But I always felt safe. I never felt scared. There was only one trip where we were meant to go to Colombia, mm -hmm. and I canceled it last minute because I thought, you know, there comes a point where you don't want to push it too far. And there was this girl, I remember a few years before, a memory of this American girl, I can't remember her name, but she had traveled to Israel to the, to the Palestinian border, and she had been doing a peace demonstration. She had sat out there with a white flag, trying to bring peace between right the Israelis and the Palestinians to remove that divide. And a tank from the Palestinian side ran over her and killed her. And so, you know, that I think, in a way, right? God bless her. She lost her life. But that was something where. You know, it made me realize, don't think you're invincible to spirit, that someone isn't going to, you know, not everyone, even if we sit there and we are, here I am of the light, we've got to sort of be savvy. We have to be spiritual warriors. We have to know that there is a time sometimes when you do have to defend yourself, when you have to know not to go into the line of fire because you may get killed. <laughs> so that that was something that I learned there as well is know when to push the boundaries, get outside of your comfort zone, learn, grow, stretch yourself. But don't don't try and do things where which are too too crazy so yeah I definitely and there's so many other things that happen along the way in my adventures of traveling around the world and now that's very much integrated for me and I sort of bring those spiritual lessons into how I do business with people so and now you do spiritual coaching you are bringing I, I call it the two-step dance and you actually just illustrated it great by by this this poor woman who was sitting on the border which is, on the one hand, you dive in inside as deep as you possibly can. On the other hand, you get out of the way of the tank. Yes, seriously. And I I mean, this is the thing again, that I think the lesson I've learned at the moment is, for example, with what we're doing with Hyper Chariot, mm -hmm. rather than, you know, people refer to it as disruption, right? We're a disruptive industry. This is sort of like how when the dot-com came along, it was the new frontier. It was like the wild west. And, and this, the, the same even with the internet marketing and YouTube. I mean, I remember a few years back going to the Variety New Media Summit and then talking about how everything we would go onto multiple devices, but then it wasn't really happening. And then it happened very fast within a two, three period. Boom. And I think that you know, again, when I think about people say, well, you're going into an area, right, which is disruptive travel. I don't want to think of myself as a disruptor, but more about evolving. When people say, well, we've got to get rid of the pipelines and, you know, in North Dakota, it's like, how can we work with the oil companies? Because actually, instead of putting oil tr through pipelines, we can put people through the tubes and then we're not pulling all the oil out the earth. And we're finding a way to evolve. So I like to look at things of, well, they're bad and we're right. It's a, a yes and. How can we really create solutions where we're, we're all on the same page? And the science of getting rich by Wallace Wattles, you know, he talked about how these big industrialists came along and we're doing certain things and, and we look at them as, well, this is bad. But it's almost like part of these spiritual lessons of, 
that is great. Like from the, from the human perspective, it's, this is terrible. But from the spiritual perspective, when we look from a soul perspective, there is growth. There is things here that there is evolution happening for our planet that we don't quite understand. And if we can gain that perspective from earlier on and not be so resistant. And again, we've seen this a lot politically. I try not to go on as like a left or a right thing of politics because I just try to keep trying what spirit system has come back to. What can we learn here? How can we all work together instead of Thank you. I'm right and you're wrong. So that's why, you know, I just feel like let's just focus on solutions and and not go into the ego driven side of things. Thank Easier said than done. <laughs> it, it, it is, but if you can step back with with a spiritual lens and truly believe that universe happens through you and for you rather than to you. If you get that, then in the moment, no matter what it is, incredibly painful though it can be, it's a Taurus. It's that, that spiral moving upwards. And you can feel like you're back at square one, but you can never be because you are always, always evolving. Absolutely. And we're not going to stop, right? We're really Ooh. not. But what I feel that... We are very much, I remember a number of years ago, over 20 years ago, going to the pyramids in Egypt. And I remember going into one of these particular pyramids and getting this download from spirit was that we were moving into the light age. And I didn't quite understand what that was at the time, but I feel that this light age is where it's this where multimedia and internet and and now transport this next thing everything is going to start moving faster and faster mm -hmm. i think it's very difficult for people because as empaths everyone is empathetic very empathetic some people more so than others people are trying to shut it down they're getting you know getting really scared they try and soothe themselves with sugar to alcohol to certain foods that aren't good for themselves to caffeine and and so being able to get back into our bodies and to be able to feel and to take care of ourselves and not be scared of this acceleration. Back then when I went to Egypt, everyone talked about it. They said, well, there's going to be, it's, oh, what was it? It was, everyone thought we were going to just lift off the planet and go. And, Ascension and it was or something. This, yes, it was the Ascension. There was something else. It was, oh my gosh, it's gone in my head what it was called. But it was the whole, there was all these light work and the light worker community saying, well, we've got to just lift off the planet. We're just, you know, we've got to just go out of here. But for me, what I felt came was this idea of actually we need to bring heather and, and earth together within our physical bodies. Mm -hmm. So that we're here on the planet. We're not like, oh, earth is bad or what people are doing on the earth is bad or just reach for the stars. There really is this integration and this growth that comes so that you're working with uh, from sort of like the energy healer perspective, that six pointed star, that the form of it in balance when it clicks together is this diamond and that we are these diamonds of light. And that that starting point for a diamond, what a diamond normally starts out in the rough. <laughs> it has to be shaped. It has to be formed. So we really are in a, a period right now of massive, massive acceleration. And it is very, very intense for people. But what I have received in my own intuition and a message from spirit is just do the best that you can. You know, some people are going to the extreme with stuff where they feel, well, it's all or nothing. It's so black or white. I find that when something impacts me and I get uh, triggered from my past wounds mm -hmm. and I want to just go for the sugar and I want to just check out and I want to attack someone else, not physically, but mentally, I want to say, oh, well, look at them, look at what's wrong. I've just, I've just learned now to come back and go, okay, what am I not allowing myself to feel? And, and that's where when I wrote Big Miracles, just to be able to have to put that together into 11 specific, very simple steps to follow, it gets me back on track because I can, you know, when I derail, I can do a lot of damage to myself in a very short space of time, very short space of time. So right now, I, you know, I was on the sugar, I'm off the sugar. I will admit I'm having a little bit of caffeine this morning, but I find it fuels me when I do my running. <laughs> so it's, yeah. I think it's being okay with not doing things perfectly, but we are not slowing down. Like things in terms of what's happening with the planet and our consciousness and this age of light, 
and a new renaissance. This age of light really is a new renaissance that goes back to that time of Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo. You know, we are this new generation of that. And there's more and more. I feel that there, you know, where there was a few leaders back then, many of us in our community, it's like a it's like we're all leaders and we're all finding that leadership isn't about tyranny and, and dictatorship. It is how can we encourage, how can we nurture each other? How can we all be miracle workers together? Woohoo! Yes! So, so let's let's dive from there. And and our show is about shining bright, helping bring more light to the world, helping people to shine their light which is inside of each and every one of us. So couldn't agree more. So let's, let's dive into the rules real quickly. We'll, we'll take them off one by one, maybe just a thing or two on each one. We started talking about aligning with spirit, but there's this something that's really cool. Well, I guess there are two things. First off, spiritual intention and miracle journals. And maybe we can start with the spiritual intention. I mean, if you don't have an intention and, and the idea of what is an intention and an intention is an ask. A lot of the time I will say to someone, so what have you got? What are your goals? What do you want for your life? Uh, I don't know. I've never thought about it. How much, how much money would you like to make this year? So you can do the things you'd love to do. Um, I don't know. I just want to make a lot of money. Well, I mean, a lot of money is relative. It's sort of like how you gave the example of your mom saying Bill Gates earlier. If Bill Gates was just going to go and generate 100000 in revenue, oh, my gosh, that would be a dire year for him. <laughs> so getting intentional means thinking about what do I want and then why do I want it? Because if you have a certain intention but you don't understand your why, as soon as you hit an obstacle – and there is some form of resistance that comes up, you will not be able to persist. I was someone that was always great at starting mm -hmm. projects and doing things and then finishing them, forget it. I was the starter and not the finisher. And I am proud to say that I am now someone that is brilliant at finishing things. <laughs> for, for those who are, are only listening to this, I'm thumping on her beautiful book right here. Thank you, yes. I mean, that was a labor of love. There were times towards the end where I literally felt like I was being pulled apart from the inside out. And, but my intention, my intention was, and I, I love this, that my editor from HarperCollins, mm -hmm. Libby Edelson, we had sat down at a lunch before I signed with HarperCollins. And this is how I knew I had to go with, go with them as my publisher, where she said, when we do a book, we are in service to the book. Oh, just lit me up from the inside out. I was like, yes, service to the book. So the idea of big miracles, I knew it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to tell this story uh, about big miracles. This was almost as if spirit will say to us, okay, who wants to volunteer for this project mm -hmm. about the idea of creating big miracles? And I put my hand up and I said, me, me, I want to want to be the one to do that. And I didn't know the half of how I had a sense that it would be challenging, but it just it just forced me to have to dig so deep and strip away within myself to this idea of being a spiritual vehicle. So I had to really focus on rule one, align with spirit, and this idea of being a spiritual vehicle, setting one's intention. And, and as you do that, anything that isn't working in your life will come up with a vengeance. So it, I think that when you set an intention, it really raises the bar for you. And then when that energy comes up, when those fears come up, when that resistance comes up, if you just let it swirl around in your head, it is sticking in your energy field. And by writing down in a miracle journal, suddenly you get to make sense of the mess that's happening up here. It's You can see it on the page, but it's not just about seeing it. It's that it allows you to take it out of your energy field. You're saying, hang on, these things where you don't feel good in yourself, I'm going to put it on the page. There is a transmutation, a recycling of energy as you get clear in your thoughts. So the miracle journey really helps one to do that. Beautiful. On, on those lines, just just a, a, a brief note on your book. I, I've, I've read, I read a book a day pretty much for the show. And so I've, I've read, we're 550 shows in, so it's, it's quite a few books. Your book goes deep. And One you said, <laughs> co-creation, co-creation, but thank yeah. you. <laughs> so um, 
you dove deep. You said you dug deep, but okay, so I have a lot of beautiful books that I read, and oftentimes they get to a certain level, and then they kind of skim across. There's nothing that goes beyond it. You either racked your brain or you sat quietly and said, you've got to give me something to go on here because you dug, and each piece you dug once, you dug twice, and you just kept on going down the rabbit hole in each, each chapter. And that's very unusual and it's very special because you don't get stuck. So we're, we're talking about right now getting into alignment and we're talking about a miracle journal. You don't get stuck in any of these one sections and go, I just don't know what to do from here and be left with a, well, just go sit quietly in a corner and the answer will come to you. You dug, you really, really dug. Yeah, it was, I felt myself, my, my head stretched mentally in a way where it broke down my beliefs and my ideas, where I like to think of myself that I'm open-minded, but I have a lot of uh, patterns, things where I get very focused in a certain way. So there's the benefits to that. And then there's the negative to that as well. And it just, there was points where I kept focusing on how can I be of service to the idea of big miracles? And, and it literally, it felt like my head was going to explode. And that was incredibly intense and painful, but it broke down my, my beliefs. And then having to surrender because rule two is, you know, if, if I am to be a spiritual vehicle, what must I surrender? For me, it's, it's ego, it's pain, it's fear. I think it's that for a lot of people, different versions of that. We just have different stories of that. But sometimes it would be, <clears throat> I literally had to just go and lie down. Sometimes I was lying down. Like there was one day towards the end where I'd make Nick <clears throat> go out to coffee bean for me and get me chai teas. I, like I couldn't do it without sugar. It was just like, it was just because I was stretching so much and I'd lie down on my yoga mat and I go, I feel so nauseated. I feel so sick here. But it's it because what it was, it was all my stuff coming up that was just locked in. Mm -hmm. That so like when I think of Buck Rogers in the 25th century, and he was bigger, frozen bigger, bigger, bigger. and all this ice. <laughs> Love that show. That's <laughs> one of my favorite shows as a kid. So he was frozen the night, right? He was frozen there. I sort of feel like there was a part of me, like a bad part of me that was frozen. And as I started to work on big miracles and write more and more it thawed that ice. And then there was all these, there was this, ugh, you know, this icky part of me there. There was sort of like, sounds disgusting, like rotting meat and daggers and war and severe pain and just heaviness that was there. It was like, ugh, so that was all coming up. And I literally, I would just have to lie there. And then I would get back up. My, my, my personal book editor, Stephanie Gunning, who's absolutely amazing. I remember one day getting on the phone with her and, and she said, I, 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 we were like towards the end and I, I needed to get the, the final edit into Harper's. And she said, okay, we're going over chapter one here. And she said, can I suggest something radical to you? And I said, yes, Stephanie, of course. And she said, well, if you could cut this, 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 and she kept going this, 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 this. I said, that's 18 pages out of 20. And she said very calmly, yes. I just thought, oh my gosh, you have wow. got to be kidding me. And I just went, okay. Now in the past, I wouldn't have done that. You know, many years ago, I would just be like, oh, well, she's wrong. Or what does she know? Or, you know, I, I would have just felt like that I'm right and these people are wrong. But it just having that level of accountability mm -hmm. from super smart people who are focused on a level of excellence, not excellence for the sake of excellence, again, but with the idea of being of service and communicating a message. So this, the, the transformation that came from me for this was just so, so huge. And now it's sort of landing me in a direction that I never thought I would go with Hyperchariot. <laughs> with Nick. So, yes. I, I love it. So we'll, we'll talk briefly about a, a few of the others, and, and it really dovetails what you're saying, sit, sitting there with Stephanie and having her tell we're going to cut 18 out of 20. Not only is that surrender, but it takes us right to rule number three, which is 
committing and committing to your breakthrough. What, is, what does that really mean? And how do we really commit? Well, committing means that you're not waiting for things to happen. I can't tell you the amount of times I waited for someone to say yes to me in my life. And, and there were times when I took actions and got rejection. And then I thought, well, I'm just going to wait some more, especially when I worked in the film industry. I remember when I lived in London at the time, and then the SAG strike was happening. Mm -hmm. And, and so I, I reached out to Julia Roberts agent, who was head of ICM at the time. And, and I did at that point, I didn't wait, I just got on a plane, went out there, met with him next thing it was like out of some like, like out of the player with Tim Robbins and doing the Hollywood thing, but then everything crashed and burned because I thought like, Oh, it's all just happening. And I was quite naive in a lot of ways. And so I ended up going from having this house in the Hollywood Hills to being on a friend's garage floor in Burbank on a blow up mattress. And then going back to England with my tail between my legs and then just waiting, you know, like I thought I was still taking actions mm -hmm. But at that point, I, I, I felt like I had been kicked in the stomach so severely. And I took it so personally, I didn't realize, well, that's just Hollywood. That's just how it is. Like, you just dust yourself off and you just get back up and keep going. I mean, it happens in many industries, not just Hollywood. It's just like so blatant in Hollywood. And, and so then I just started waiting. I thought I wasn't. I, mean, I put on a massive amount of weight after that happened. I ended up being a, for me, I ended up being a size 12. Uh, you know, it was just like food, food, food. I just could not cope. Eventually I stopped waiting and I realized if I just broke it down into bite-sized chunk and I just took a little a step at a time, a step at a time, another step, and I just kept showing up. And I think that now for myself, what I just say is I'm committed no matter what. And then if something doesn't go so well in a day, even if it feels like a step backwards, I know that I'm still moving forward. Because a lot of the time, if we look at, say, uh, a company's annual revenue, right, we look at the cash flow over a year, or for our own earnings, if we're entrepreneurs or small business owners, you'll see this on the graph, the, right, the up, down, up, down, but ultimately it goes the chart, the trajectory of the graph shows that it is a steady incline. It's just when we're going through it, it doesn't look like that. I feel like precision running class is like that. You go up and down through your speeds, but progressively you find yourself increasing. Absolutely. And if we look at the statistics for our show, we've been on this meteoric climb. But if you look at it from day to day or last week, it looked like looked, if you looked at the week, like it was quote unquote down. And my wife, Jessica, she's, she's not too worried about the numbers. She goes, aren't you concerned about that? And I said, no, you know, I haven't been following the news too carefully for the last few weeks because the negativity was just a bit too much. I'm like, but there might be a lot going on in the world. Who knows? And so you, using your term, I was reframing the story or, or, or giving a new narrative to it. And mm -hmm. then all of a sudden this week hit and it's the record of all record weeks. And so if you get too stuck in the story, whatever it is, yeah, I'm like, yeah. woohoo. But if you get too stuck, all of a sudden you can think things are down when they're actually quite up. And I guess at the end of the day, the, the corollary is don't look at the numbers at all because you are so much more than your number. Absolutely. I think it's that thing of being able to look at numbers, figure out, gain information from it, and then keep moving. It's just keep moving. So you don't get attached to it. Yeah. And you know that it's just part of the growth. Because I really do believe that spirit is in the numbers and that we can learn a lot from ourselves around numbers. And it's just, it shows us the actions. It shows us the actions that we've taken. But then we don't stop. That idea of commit to your breakthrough is you want to get to a certain place. You just go, okay, well, then I need to do even more or I need to be patient. I need to keep doing what I'm doing and be patient with things. It's interesting. In automatic writing, I've heard this. I can tell you've been getting this with your book as well. When you're in alignment, when you're in co-creation, what I've gotten out of automatic writing is worry. Why worry? This isn't yours to begin with. It's a co-creation. Yeah. And when you realize you are serving and you are in alignment, then there is nothing to worry about. It's, it's hard to get out of that place of fear. But what you're doing is so much bigger than just you. Absolutely. It goes back to what you said at the beginning when we started talking, which is just breathe. <laughs> <laughs> 
it's coming right, coming back to that so that we can get back into our bodies. And Because one of the things I noticed, I went to an event last year with a lot of very, very spiritual people, a number of healers there. And what I saw was some of these people are carrying so much pain within themselves. They're not allowing themselves to breathe, to be present, to allow themselves to forgive themselves. And and so there, I see this big disconnect of where well, you're going around and healing others and there you are hobbling maybe with like a hip issue or a massive amount of extra weight on you and it, it there comes a point where it, it's sort of like Carolyn Meese had talked about it the wounded healer archetype right I know that I healed through healing others because finally I would see other people healing and go okay now I'm going to give myself permission to do that for myself mm-hmm. but what I see with some people is that they are focused just on healing others and then using it as a crutch not to look at their own stuff. And, and I think that that is really, really important because the pain is too much to bear because if you start unpacking it all, it, it does. There is a period of overwhelm that comes up. But I think it is so vitally important to say, you know what, I'm going to allow myself to step forward and move into that and feel, feel the feelings. Oh, my gosh. You know, then anything is possible. I'm I'm going back to your suitcase in Mexico analogy here, and you were talking about unpacking. So we've got unpacking and we've got suitcases and how much lighter. You need to go through this because you will be lighter. You will be able to pivot. You will be able to live your greatest life. And helping others is great, but the person you have to help first is yourself or ultimately speak to us. The the importance, incredible importance of self-love. Yeah, I mean, we have been conditioned that we're being selfish. We put ourselves first, selfish child. Oh, all you do, a teenager, all you do is think about yourself. You don't care about other people. Right, so then there's that thing of, well, I mustn't do that for myself. You know, taking a break and, and slowing down. Why aren't you doing something? I mean, I, I often... I, I think it's, again, about finding a balance. But I know for myself there were times as a teenager when I would sit in front of the TV a lot. Mm-hmm. And now if I – for me, I, I, I love movies and I love great – TV, you know, really good quality TV. And and so, like, for me, that gives me inspiration. And there's times where I won't give myself permission to sit down and watch something because I would think, well, I'm being selfish. I'm being lazy. But what I realize more and more now is that that fuels inspiration and creativity for me. Say, like I'd watched the movie The Martian, and afterwards I'm I just moved to tears and I'm so mm-hmm. inspired and thinking, wow, oh my gosh, I came up like I came away from that thinking, just believe and courage. Or say, I watch a show on I watched not so long ago on Amazon Prime, Red Oaks, exec produced by Steve Sodenberg. Right? I just and I just lo- I binge watched that show and I just loved it. Set in the eighties, there's a lot of nostalgia for me. It just made me think about a lot of things of teenage years. It's like going back through memories, and and that sometimes the way that we get to relax, unwind, or do certain things that are fun is not selfish. Mm-hmm. We need some downtime. You can't sprint full out 24-7. We need time to recharge. And in this age of light, this age of speed that we are in, <laughs> because everything's now, 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 it is not selfish. So I think self-care is a vitally important thing. But I'll tell you, I still struggle. I'll, sometimes I'll say to my husband, I'll say, I need to go and book myself a reflexology, and then I won't do it. Like I'll say it over and over, and I, I don't do it. But then when I do do it, I feel a thousand times better and I have energy then to keep going because I sort of feel like for those of us who are focused on being of service, it is a marathon. And, and we we need nourishment, spiritual nourishment, emotional nourishment, the right people around us to be able to keep moving forward with our our visions and the way that we're going to be of service. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I was going to say you, you just need another NASCAR race can come up so that he can go to the yeah. race, you go to the spa. <laughs> exactly. And I do, I've gone to NASCAR races with him. We've gone as a family. We've gone to the NASCAR races together. And, uh, and then sometimes Nick will hang out with Dominic and, and I get to go to the spa. He's very, I have an, he's an amazing husband. And then if I don't get to go to the spa, he actually does, does my feet for me. 
very, <laughs> very nice. <laughs> Nick's an amazing healer too. I'm blessed, I tell you, because I was a disaster in relationships until I met him. So I definitely met my, my soulmate. What's the, and we get to start to, to wind things down, but what's the 30 second secret? How'd you meet him? We were in a sketch comedy show together in a hole in the wall theater in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. So thank God Camilla, um, Prince Charles and Camilla got married because I was brought into the show to do a sketch and then met Nick and my sketches were cut and he felt sorry for me. And so he ended up, we put, he put together this sketch, which was, we did a British rap. It was so fun. It was hilarious. And, and we fell in love from there. And he took me to the Ritz 14 weeks in a row when he was working there as a waiter at the Ritz Carlton. And wow. there we go. <laughs> so one last question directly on the book, then a few quick wrap up questions, but this is just, I think this is an awesome, awesome tool we can all use for ourselves. Can you tell us the importance of writing a letter from your future you to yourself? Yeah, I mean, gosh, if I think back to what I know now, if I had been able, what I know now to help that 20-year-old me, oh my goodness, I would have achieved so much more. And, and so that, was, that, that is already there within our energy field. I mean, I think I need to go and write another letter. <laughs> if I was to go and write a letter from the 60-year-old me to the 40-year-old me, what a difference there would be. Because we can download information that is already in our energy field and our consciousness that is there with our intelligence and, and to show us. It gives us clues. There are messages from spirit specifically there for us when we write from that future self. Wisdom's already inside us, and it just needs to be extracted. And then it also just shows that no matter what challenge someone is going through right now, that one will get through. And, and to just, oh, just let oneself go, okay, I may not like exactly where I am today, say, be it financially, be it with one's health, but that there is a road to recovery. Lisa Goodman, who was my nutritionist, I wrote about her in Big Miracles. I saw her speak last night and she shared about, I mean, going back 20 years ago for her, she had a really serious form of cancer where she was told she was going to die. And now in her 50s, she is healthier than ever. And so, you know, to me that she really is a testament to being able to connect into that future self. A lot of the time we don't connect into our wisdom or the, the future wisdom of ourselves because things haven't got dire enough. They haven't got bad enough. Why wait for things to get horrific and to hit a serious rock bottom to create a transformation? For some people, that rock bottom does end up in suicide. It does end up in, you know, in life being in, in lost. And that doesn't need to happen. And that is why it's so vitally important that if one can just have the courage to be vulnerable and say, I'm scared right now, or my finances suck, or I really am unhappy, or I do feel like isolating myself. So it's that thing of when we look at social media, and we just everyone just shows when they look good, and things are going well, some people show a little bit of, you know, stuff, but to put oneself out there and to be vulnerable, it takes a lot. And I know a lot of people want to isolate. I've done it myself. The amount of times where I'm told, you know, go and put yourself on Instagram, do this, do that, I should be doing tons of YouTube videos. I don't like, it's like, I want to retract and not be seen. And yet if one comes back to, it's not about what people think of us, but just being ourselves and being able to share ourselves. Because I know sometimes in the middle of the night, if I wake up, I'll pop onto YouTube, I'll stick my headphones in and I'll watch them. And I think, gosh, I'm so glad that that person is sharing their message, their story, or they're having a conversation with someone else. And, and then I go, why don't I do that more? <laughs> Right. Little, I'm here with you right now. So that's good, right? Little bit, baby steps. I like it. So a few quick wrap up questions. First off, you have shared your story and so much more. Where can people go to find Beer Mir Big Miracles and to find out more? Well, I'm so delighted that Big Miracles is in Target. It's on Amazon. It's in Barnes and Noble. It's really cool. It's everywhere. And and so, yeah, it's in all bookstores. And what I love about Amazon is one can get it next day. Boom. And like I said, with Hyper Chariot, it'll be in the next hour. 
like it. Do you have a website you want to send people to as well? I do. Yes. My website is joannagarzilli.com. J-O-A-N-N-A-G-A-R-Z-I-L-L-I. And then my Instagram and my Twitter is at Joanna Garzilli. So I'm on there connecting, right? We're all social. (laughs) doing my best to be social. I like it. And if you didn't catch that, come on over to inspirenationshow.com and we'll help you be social with Joanna as well. So a few quick wrap-up questions. First off, Jessica, my wife, she's the producer. She always wants me to ask words of wisdom you give parents for their kids today. Just love your kids. Just love them. I, I mean, I find it's just wrap them in love. I think there's just so much pressure to parent in a certain way and I remember when I first looked at the parenting all these different books and I put it all aside and I just went back to just focusing on just tapping into my intuition and I just I shower my son with love I'm just kissing him and hugging him all the time and and he like as a boy he likes to fight and I say I'm gonna fight you with kisses I'm gonna grab little chicken thighs and (laughs) kiss him and kiss him woohoo there's no such thing as too much love, is there? No. Oh, my gosh. Are you kidding me? Absolutely not. Yes. So he is very, very loved. And I see that he's confident and, and, and so sensitive and caring with others. I just think love is the best thing. And, and children make mistakes rather than berating them and just saying, look, here, you made a mistake like this. And that's okay. And here's how to improve it. And, and I still love you. Like, don't dwell on the thing and make the child wrong and tell them that they're terrible. Just say, Here's the mistake, and I love you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So on that note, what personally brings you the greatest happiness or what I call the woohoo factor? My husband, Nick, brings me the greatest happiness. He is my best friend. He's the love of my life. I can get a little bit grumpy with him sometimes because, I mean, I can't get away from myself. That's like if he wasn't there, I'd still be like, ah. But he, you know, when I write down in my miracle journal, what am I grateful for? It's Nick, it's Dominic, it's my health, and it's my home. Those are the things that are most important for me. Awesome, and that would be a woohoo. <laughs> yes, a big woohoo. <laughs> woo-hoo! I love it. Before we do a really brief meditation, any last words of wisdom you want to share with people today? Allow yourself to be vulnerable, allow yourself to be seen and to know that you're enough. And this idea of, well, what is a big miracle? The idea of being a miracle worker is your heart's beating and you are that miracle. And so I suppose that would be a good segue into helping people connect to their hearts, to be able to center, to ground, to connect within themselves. Perfect. Go for it. Thank you. So I would just say, take a moment to take your hand, place it on your heart. And just take a couple of deep breaths into your body. You know, and that power of when you take your hand and you place it over your heart, that you are saying, I value myself. I love myself. I am enough. I am beauty, I am light, I am power, I am divine, and ultimately I am a miracle worker. And just notice how it feels when you have your hand over your heart. What is that connection that this idea is as you have your hand over your heart, imagine a beautiful golden light above your head flowing in through the top of your head. And that golden light that represents healing, wisdom, bringing in this new renaissance of innovation, of creativity, of wisdom, allowing that golden light to flow in through the top of your head to fill your heart and also to move down through your shoulder, through your arm, through your hand. So It's coming from both directions, flowing directly into your heart and through your hands into your heart. So that you feel love in all directions, all love surrounds you, all love within you, and that you are this radiant being of light. And then if you want, you can keep your hand there or you can place it down by your side. You can keep one hand on your heart, put another hand on your belly. Trust, connect into yourself. 
and just become aware of what feels right for you right now. And as you feel yourself filling with that golden light, that light emanating from you, that you say, yes, I am a spiritual vehicle. I am a spiritual vehicle. So visualize yourself now as a spiritual vehicle, as a golden orb of light. Traveling through time and space. And yet sitting, being or lying within the space that you're in. Allowing yourself to be there, to be present in this special vibration. And that no matter what is happening around you, no matter what things are occurring, that you can still maintain your center because things happen in life, right? Unexpected things happen. Challenges occur. Interruptions, objections, obstructions. But you keep coming back to your heart center. So right now with your hand on your heart, take another deep inhale. Hold for a moment. And as you exhale, allow yourself to find your energy settling even more within your body. Feel that golden light within you. And say to yourself, I am centered. I am grounded. I am connected. I am love. I am light. I am wisdom. And let that golden light to continue to flow through you. Feel that golden light now move from your heart, connecting down, moving through your spine, down through your legs to the soles of your feet. Feel that energy of miracles. That golden light is miracles. And say to yourself, I am a miracle. And I am so grateful my heart is beating. I am health. I am wealth. I am love. I forgive myself. I forgive my parents. I forgive the people that I went to school with. I forgive anyone who has hurt me. I am compassion. Take a deep inhale, exhale, I am compassion. Really see if you can feel it, right? A lot of the time we say words and we don't allow ourselves to feel. This idea of sticks and stones can break my bones, but names can never hurt me. Names, words can hurt. But if we see those words as an opportunity for spiritual growth, to step into more of ourselves, to be more love, to be more courageous, and come back to this idea, anchoring within ourselves, I am a miracle worker, and I will create miracles today. And whoever I see, when they see me shining brightly, whether it's in the traffic, whether it's in the supermarket, whether it's walking down the street, whether it's in the doctor's office, or picking up your child from school, I am a miracle worker. It just emanates from you. And that you get to inspire others. Yes, I am an inspiration. Take a deep inhale. And on the exhale, I am an inspiration. I am a miracle worker. Feel it in every cell of your being. Feel that strength. Feel that light. And as you come back, as you journey back into your heart, connecting into your center, I am centered, I am grounded, I am connected, I am a miracle, and I am spreading miracles today. I'm of service to all those who need me. Spirit, show me where to go, show me what to say. Let me be that spiritual vehicle, move through me. Let me be that inspiration. And then take a couple more gentle breaths. Oh, slowly, gently opening your eyes, reconnecting with your space and noticing that shift and vibration from a few minutes before.
<sighs> and interesting, the energy that came up there, that we had someone ringing at the doorbell and stuff going on. And I think that's the thing of when we step into being more of who we're meant to be, a lot of the time, stuff, come, like, stuff comes up, resistance or energy from outside. It's not necessarily a bad thing either. Who knows? It could have been something coming from Amazon, some gift. <laughs> we had on Rick. We had on Rick Hansen last year uh, on on happiness, and uh, in the middle of the meditation, he goes, "Let it all go," and then a mower came on, and he goes, "And let the mower go too." <laughs> it's it's so it it seems to have it. It just seems to happen. It happened to me, and I was doing an interview the other week for Well and Good, and it didn't happen once. It's like four interruptions throughout the interview. And I just went, okay. Spirit's just part of it. Yes. That's the thing. We just have to not go, oh, what's going wrong? Or here's an interruption. It's just staying centered and aligned no matter what. Woohoo! Woohoo! <laughs> Thank you so much, Joanna. This has been tremendous fun. You're cool. This is you're the real deal. You're cool. You're cool. You're cool. Coming back at you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. This is just everybody. Go out. Get big miracles. There's a lot you're gonna get out of this. You are gonna stretch. You are gonna grow. You are no longer going to play it small. And then make a miracle book. See. I yes. love it. So for those who are not on YouTube, she has this beautiful purple miracle box. Is this what you put your miracle ideas with a gold pen in each yeah, night before you, you go to sleep? Yeah, you miracle box, exactly. And then, boom. See, you got your little pen, your little thing. In this miracle box, I have, can you see that? Uh, it says, Big Miracles. Oh, the cover oh, of your does. book is on the bottom. Yes, that's right. And, and with then, it, like uh, gold leaf. On the bottom yeah, as well. Exactly. We put a little pop the little miracles in and boom. It's been such a delight being with you today. It has been such a delight having you on the show as well. We'll have to have you back in the future. There's so much exactly. we can cover. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. You you're an awesome, shining rock star. <laughs> Woohoo! Coming from you who knows rock stars, that means yes. something. So thank yes. you. <laughs> For everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get big miracles, and step toward your ultimate success, and shine bright. Woohoo! Yes! Awesome, Joanna. Thank you. Wonderful to be with you. So fun. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments. Have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're going to get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, inspirenationshow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else, and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>